We need at least three phases in our approach to democratizing Europe and stopping this process of further deterioration. The first thing we need to do is we need to campaign for transparency. My experience, since you asked me about my experience, is that people say appalling things in the Eurogroup, in the European Council meetings and so on and so forth. Things that if there was a camera beaming what they are saying into everyone's home would not be said. And I believe that having this set of checks and balances operating under the gaze and the scrutiny of citizens would lead to far different outcomes than the ones we had, at least while I was there. So transparency, number one. It sounds like a small thing, but it's not. It's gigantic. You know, think about how life would be different if everybody could see everybody else <laughs> during difficult moments and decisions. Right? Secondly, we need to um, work hard to convince the average European that there is an alternative to what is going on. This is where, as the left, we have failed so far. Uh, people like, you know, various mayors in uh, this wonderful country, in Zaragoza, in Valencia, in Madrid, in Barcelona, um, in La Coruña, they have convinced the local communities that there is an alternative and they've proven to them that there is. But we need to do it at the European level. That there is an alternative to the policies of the central bank. And that instead of buying 65 billion euros every month of government debt from Germany, from Italy, from Spain, there is a better way of doing this of um, uh, purchasing, let's say, bonds issued by the Europe's investment bank to go straight into sustainable development, into green energy. We have to convince them that there is a better way of handling the debt, of restructuring the debt, of reducing the debt without, in the end, hurting anyone, uh, but making life more sustainable and less debt uh, constrained. Uh, thirdly, we need uh, to show them that uh, it is possible to reduce income inequality, both through taxation and, importantly, through uh, an anti-poverty scheme that runs throughout Europe. Not in Spain, not in Portugal, but even in Germany, even in Holland, where there is poverty to be addressed through a program of, uh, like, for instance, giving credits to families that can find it hard to educate their kids or to put food on the table, uh, to give them credits, credit cards if you want, or debit cards, charged with the profits of the European system of central banks. Once you address the average non-political, non-leftist European who knows that there's something wrong today in Europe with these very moderate proposals, and you say to them, OK, what's wrong with those? Why don't we do that? then you have access to them and then you can build the European movement for democracy and for shared prosperity that we are lacking now. So this is the second phase. The third phase has to be an attempt to unify us, uh, to, to do, uh, towards constitutional unification. Uh, either we're going to go our separate ways and we're going to be torn apart as Europe or we're going to be genuinely united. Uh, people say, but you can't unite the Spaniards with the Slovaks, with the Greeks. Well, I believe you can. Uh, and, but what you need is a common identity. It would be good if we had a common language. Well, we don't. But we can have a common identity. In the United States, for instance, many say to me that, oh, they speak the same language. That's not so. You know, millions of Americans don't speak English, by the way. But still they're joined together by a, a document a rule book called the Constitution of the United States of America. It's a highly readable document. I may disagree with lots of things that it says, but it doesn't matter. It's a beautiful piece of literature that Americans feel was written by their representatives and represents them, each and every one of them. They swear to that Constitution. We need something like that. But we need to write it as citizens. We don't need some former prime minister or president to write it on behalf of corporations. It has to be done from the movements from constituent assemblies in the cities and the municipalities all the way up. It, it, it was a long answer, but it was a very long question too. There is no democracy whatsoever. And you don't have to take my word for that. Take the word of Wolfgang Schäuble, my former um, colleague from uh, 
the German Federal Finance Ministry. In my first Eurogroup meeting, he told me, in front of everyone, as a dictum, in no uncertain terms, elections cannot be allowed to change the economic policy in your country. Wow. Okay? You know what? I appreciate that because it was completely open. And he gave me an opportunity to answer and to say that this, to me, sounds like a wonderful gift to the Chinese Communist Party, which also believes that elections should not be allowed to change economic policy in China. <laughs> so uh, it's official now. Democracy is absent. There's no democratic deficit in Brussels. There's just no democracy. Yeah. Uh, and and the, 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 what most European citizens do not understand is the incompetence of the institutions. You go there and you think you're going to be met with a very competent enemy that they want to, you know, to, to, to impose the iron will upon you, which they do. But you think that at least they're, com they're competent and you can have a discussion with them where you understand their position, they understand your position and then you clash. No, not true. Firstly, you've got to understand that the Eurozone is primarily the Troika. And the Troika consists of three institutions, the Commission, the Fund, the International Monetary Fund and the Central Bank. Now, they disagree with one another. Uh, one of the, most, the greatest sources of headache for me and for my, the rest of my government was that you know, I talked to the IMF, they said one thing. They said, oh, we are right about debt relief, we need to reduce your debt, we need to give you a debt haircut. Huh? But on the question of labor markets, X, Y, Z. Then you go to the Commission, oh, on the labor markets you are right, but don't talk to us about debt relief. Then you go to the Central Bank, then you get another view. So there was complete horizontal disintegration of the Troika. Different views. And each one of them had different red lines. Then, within the institution, you talked to President Juncker, you got one view. You got talked to Moscovici, just below him, you got a slightly different view. Not very different, same. You talked to Declan Costello, the apparatchik below Moscovici, you got a completely different view. Same in the IMF. You talk to Lagarde, you got one view. You talk to Thompson, slightly different view. You talk to members of staff in Washington DC, utterly different view. So, uh, Henry Kissinger, the former um, fine, uh, foreign minister of the United States of America, once said that um, w when he wanted to talk to Europe, he didn't know who to call. Yeah? And he had no idea of what Europe wanted because Europe simply didn't have a coherent opinion. This is the same thing in the European Union today. And in the end, somehow, behind the scenes, they come up with a position that everybody knows is a terrible one, and then they impose it down you, on you just to make sure that you know who is boss, that it's not your electorate, that it is not your parliament, that it is not the people, that it is them. And this is why we go from one error to another, from one failure, economic failure, to another, and during this process, because when, you know, failure breeds more failure and more reaction to the failure. So in order to react to the reaction, the powers that be in Europe become more authoritarian. So the democracy is pushed further into the margins. And so you can enjoy your democratic right to vote a government or for you know, parliament in your national elections here in Spain, but that government has absolutely no power to do anything. Well, firstly, don't do it unless you have a uh, um, significant chance of making significant change. Don't accept government for the sake of accepting government. I they don't need that advice from me. I'm sure that Pablo Iglesias and everybody else understands that. But this is the, the first piece of advice I would give to a progressive uh, politician, to a progressive party. Uh, the worst thing that can happen to you is to be in government but not in power. Second piece of advice is uh, make sure that whatever you do, you internationalize it. There will never be a solution to Spain's problems simply for Spain. There will never be a, a solution to the problem of investment, to the problem of debt, to the problem of the banking sector. With all these are festering wounds of Spain. But you are going to have to argue for a change in strategy, in tactics, in policy in Europe for everybody in Europe. So it has to be an internationalist agenda.
Again, I'm sure Pablo Iglesias and uh, Podemos know that. And the third piece of advice is uh, prepare for a great deal of toxic reporting by the systemic media and don't be upset when it happens. The average citizen who feels hopeless, who feels that uh, politics doesn't work, and who either um, hides inside a reality show on television and away from real reality, or puts his or her trust into alternationalists, those who peddle simple solutions based on hate and division. These are the people that we need to wake up.